Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, sponsored by the National Health Association. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and today I'm delighted to have as my guest, Dr. Kim Scheuer. Uh, Kim is a medical physician who is board certified in both family medicine and lifestyle medicine, and she's a part of the telehealth, love life uh, telehealth service, which we're going to talk about. And welcome, Kim. It's so nice to meet you. Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association the oldest organization in the world, championing the extraordinary benefits of a whole plant food diet and healthy lifestyle, as well as water only fasting. We believe that health results from healthful living and focus on evidence-based science that promotes the health of you and your loved ones, as well as the health of all animals and the environment. We feature experts from a cross section of disciplines within the plant nutrition, vegan, psychological, environmental, and animal compassion sectors. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the NHA's Director of Health Education. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to be here. I love what you do. So thank you, you for know, inviting me. You know, when we have people that docs like yourself that have moved into working with, um, you know, plant-based uh, healthcare and things of that nature, I guess our our audience and I certainly like to know where that interest started for you. You know, how early in your personal and or professional life did you kind of get turned on to plant based living? You know, was that something that started early? Was there a health issue in your life or your family that provoked that? Give us a little background on how that happened for you. So um, when I went to college, I ended up becoming vegetarian because my roommates were vegetarian, but I was an extremely unhealthy vegetarian. I, I called myself a Milky Way vegetarian. <laughs> and I had struggled with weight since I was 13 when I stopped growing up and started growing out. And so from about 18, 19 to 47, I thought I ate healthier than most people in this country because I was vegetarian and, but I was a cheeseaholic, a chocoholic, a, yeah, not healthy vegetarian. At 47, I realized my mother had gotten breast cancer when she was 48. And I thought, how do I prevent myself from getting the breast cancer my mom had, the colon cancer that's in my family, you know, all of that, a little late, but I should look into it. And I read the China study, phenomenal book. Read that and was just shocked, watched Forks Over Knives and started doing my own research and thought, I don't get this. Why wasn't I taught this in school? Well, and, Kim, and you were already, I just to interrupt, you were already a practicing physician now for a number of years by the time you made this discovery. Oh, yeah. I had I been studying all that. Yeah. I'd been in traditional family medicine. Um, I was a hybrid hospitalist. I worked in hospitals. I was, I had my own practices in Aspen, Colorado. I um, did traditional family practice. And when I, when I learned this information, I first, for the first month I did it on my own. I first, I had never liked anything green, didn't like salads, nothing that was green. So my friend who at the same time was going to nutrition school did a three day survey on me to see how I ate. And I thought, you know, I ate so well. And she came back and she said, you eat horribly. And she used some expl expletives, not just horribly. She was like, this is terrible. I said, I can't have salad. I can't eat healthy. I don't have time for it. I don't have an interest in it. And she said she would cook for me for a month. She gave me a green smoothie that day. She's putting in kale, which I'd never heard of, and <laughs> cucumber, which I was like, oh. And she made this green smoothie and handed it to me. And she said, drink this. I'm like, no. And she convinced me to drink. And I take, took a taste. And it was amazing. And she said she would cook for me for a month. I bought her a kitchen for that. And um, she did. And so for a month, I had a green smoothie every day and healthy food that she cooked for me. And within that month, my weight plummeted. My energy soared. I, um, my athleticism, my muscles changed. I used to have really thick, muscly legs and they became much leaner, but I was stronger. I could hike up mountains easily. I'd wake up at five o'clock in the morning and be like, I'm ready. Let's go. Instead of, oh, it's five o'clock in the morning. And I just, it changed everything. I lost so much weight. And um, I had checked my cholesterol beforehand just because in my practice, I had was training 
some uh, uh, medical assistants how to draw blood, check my cholesterol before and after my cholesterol, which was normal, you know, American normal, um, plummeted and became healthy normal. And I just thought, if this happened to me, I've got to bring this to my patients. And what have I been teaching my patients? So I started doing a ton of research, going to conferences, learning from all the best, you know, and, and completely changed how I practice with my patients because I saw how it changed me. Then I saw how it changed my patients. And it wasn't that I was just giving more medicines to treat their symptoms. All of a sudden they were getting better and feeling better. And it was wonderful. And my risk of heart disease, uh, excuse me, of breast cancer plummeted. My risk of colon cancer plummeted. I started to have bowel movements. I used to think that it was normal to have a bowel movement once every three to five days. Mm. But that was normal. And all of a sudden I'm having easy, huge bowel movements. And it was so cool because I was like, what I eat gets passed through, the nutrition is absorbed and the rest is pooped out. This is wonderful. I'm losing weight and this is no longer a struggle. And I felt so much better. It changed my life. So that was how I got started. So you were you were fortunate in that through all those years, you hadn't manifested really any major pathology, any major negative change. So Interest was- yeah. Interestingly enough, you know, my cholesterol wasn't great. And the longer <clears throat> you have high cholesterol, the, the, be- the worse it is. My knees, I'm a skier and a hiker, and all of a sudden I wasn't aching anymore, which I found out I had a bone density before I had done this and I was always osteopenic. Um, And after I did this, I all of a sudden, I got another bone density. My height went up, which was weird, but I think it's because I wasn't heavier anymore. I wasn't pushing down on my bones. And so my, my height went up and my bone density improved, which was like, this makes no sense. So I had to research that. Then my gums changed. I stopped bleeding gums. You know, things that I didn't even think would be associated and would make a difference, made a difference. And makes a big difference. So is is that where that started you on that track toward uh, getting board certified in lifestyle medicine? Was that part of what started that drive for you there? Absolutely. excited about that and started moving in that direction. Well, I started to go to all these conferences and do all this research, and then they came up with the boards. I'm like, I am not taking another board. But then I realized I actually qualified for the boards with all of the study that I'd done by myself and did more, obviously did more studying before I did the boards. And I sat for the first boards with the first group because I figured they're going to be a little less harsh on us. <laughs> and... Um, I sat behind Dr. Greger and wished I could just cheat, but I didn't <laughs> because I wanted, it was, it was, I'm terrible at taking tests. So I was like nervous about it, but I ended up getting bored. I studied hard for it and um, passed, which made me very happy. Yeah. And then I realized that I wanted to live the lifestyle I was trying to get my patients to live. I ran a traditional family practice seeing patients every 15, 20 minutes. I mean, really we had scheduled longer visits, but by the time they went to the front desk, by the time they got checked in and waited for a room to be open and the nurse get, that took their vitals, I would maybe get 10 minutes with a patient. Mm-hmm. And unless I had a cancellation right after, I was not seeing the changes that I wanted. To, I wasn't able to teach the patients the way I wanted to. So I give a lot of homework. I was known for my homework, but um, it, it, uh, I wanted to start living the lifestyle and, and started transitioning to, I started a lifestyle medicine practice with my partner, Derek Olson. So it was Derek Olson, Kim Scheuer, Dots Lifestyle Medicine. And he had been a, um, a ICU and hospice nurse who got hit by a car and hmm. flattened. And so in his recovery, he, we started using lifestyle medicine on him and got him off of tons of meds because for cholesterol and blood pressure and things like that, he lost weight. He recovered better than he could have and would have had he not changed. And um, we started this practice together, but then I COVID hit. I had planned to move 
from Aspen to where I live currently now live in Salida, Colorado, and um, got lucky enough to be brought on by plant-based telehealth, which became love.life telehealth. Yeah, we're going to get into that. Let's not go there yet, because at this point, I'm just happy that you became the queen of kale at that point now. So you, I had, was. you had evolved <laughs> now into the queen of kale. We're well, going Dr- to just take a very short break. I'm here with Dr. Kim Shoyer. We're going to take a very short break to hear from our sponsor, the National Health Association, and we'll be right back. You're listening to the NHA Health Science Podcast. Dr. Frank Sabatino here, encouraging you to check out the NHA membership. For just $35 a year in the U.S. and $55 internationally, you'll have access to a wealth of resources, including our quarterly full-color print magazine, Health Science. Stay updated on the latest health tools, inspiring stories, and exclusive events like the NHA conference and plant-exclusive cruises. Join us at healthscience.org forward slash membership and make a difference in your life and the world. I'm Dr. Frank Sabatino, your host, and now back to the NHA Health Science Podcast, where more exciting insights await you. Welcome back to the Health Science Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I'm here with uh, Dr. Kim Scheuer from Love Life Telehealth. So, yeah, uh, you know, before you get into that, I, w- I found it really intriguing because in your history, um, you know, you have all your medical training, but I noticed that you had a special pension for training to work with the deaf. Yes. Uh, talk a little bit about that, because I know that was part of, uh, you had a whole master's program, you you have whole education, I know you do American Sign Language and all of that, so what was the uh, provocation for wanting to work with that population of people? So my brother is deaf, but he grew up oral. He didn't know sign language until five years after I learned. So I went to college in a place in Rochester, New York, which has a large deaf population. I was very, very good at languages when I was younger. And so I decided to take sign language. And I took a class, a graduate level class in my freshman year with a deaf teacher. And she was wonderful. She made us turn off our voices for a weekend and write about it. She, um, brought us to parties at her house and we had to leave our voices down in a box and go interact with deaf people. Um, It was great. And then I got totally involved, became an interpreter for the deaf, came home, told my brother, my brother that, you know, you're deaf, this is great, learn sign language. And he was of the junior high school age, no way. But I got a master's in deaf education um, because I always knew I wanted to be a doctor but I thought to be a good doctor, you should be a good teacher. So I got accepted into the graduate program before I even finished college. I mean, they were gonna, I actually combined a five-year program, um, got my bachelor's in science and then um, got my master's in deaf education. And then I wanted to play before I became a doctor. So I went to Sri Lanka and I was supposed to do teacher training and teach them American Sign Language, but they had their own sign language, so I learned theirs. And um, then I we developed the first uh, Sri Lankan Sign Language Dictionary. And wow, did, yeah, it was fun. So when I came back to the states and went to medical school, and I knew I wanted to work with the deaf, so I went to Rochester again for medical school, a great medical school, and was involved with the deaf community. I've done a lot of work. Um, Aspen had a, at the time that I was there and now again, um, a camp for the deaf that happens year round. And I was a doctor for them for a while. So I was able to incorporate, um, you know, my, my two worlds, the medical world and the deaf world there. And then now I, with telemedicine, I can see deaf patients anywhere that I have license and it's phenomenal. And I have quite a few deaf patients. That's fantastic. Really fantastic. Um, Kim, you know, um, you know, we know that the traditional medical education basically trains physicians to be disease managers. We know that. You, you're giving the, the, from the get-go, you're giving the understanding that disease cannot be prevented, cannot even, can certainly not be reversed in many of these chronic diseases. So talk a little bit about how, after all those years of practice, 
how you kind of structured the philosophy that you have now, how that works working for Love Life Telehealth. Let's let's kind of bring that all together. So give us a little a little glimpse of how you know your what your philosophy is and how you manifest that through the work you do with Love Life Telehealth. So the first thing is I think you should be a good example. You should live what you what you prescribe to your patients. And so I do live the lifestyle I prescribe to my patients. Um, lifestyle medicine is based on several principles, so pillars of nutrition, movement. You know, one of the biggest issues we have in, in the United States is people don't move anymore. We just sit and watch our TV and, um, and that's dangerous. Um, avoiding toxins, smoking and alcohol, um, again, the eating healthy is so important and that's more plant-based, get more, uh, a high, uh, the rainbow of colors of plants into your diet and get rid of things that are unhealthy for you. Um, getting out, you know, getting out into de-stressing. So getting out into nature and being, um, having community, sense of community. There's all of these, sleep is so important. There's all these pillars of lifestyle medicine. So I live those. And that's important because when I have a patient who says, I don't know if I can do this, I'm like, I didn't think I could. I didn't think I could eat a salad when I was 47. And now I, there's no way I would turn back because I feel so much better. I'm so much younger. I'm so much healthier. I'm so much happier. And so that's a really huge part of Love.Life Telehealth is that every single doctor that I work with um, lives the lifestyle. And so I have... We cover every all 50 states, including DC and DC. Um, and so if you wanted to see a doctor in any state in the United States or even overseas, you can see one of us who lives the lifestyle we, we, um, we prescribe to our patients and it's evidence-based. All of it is evidence-based. That's a very important thing because there's a lot of things out there that are bro science or not evidence-based. And that can lead to lots of confusion. So what I love about what I do now is I'm still a physician. If you need insulin for your type one diabetes, I definitely can prescribe that for you. And I can, I can do the testing and prescriptions of that, but I can also teach you how to use the least amount of insulin you need so that you don't have insulin toxicity effects you know, and so that you just need what's called physiological, the amount that anybody who has a pancreas that's working would need. So one of our favorite things in Love Dot Life Telehealth is getting people off of medications or preventing them from being on medications or augmenting things like you have um, a recent cancer diagnosis. How do we get you through chemotherapy, radiation if you need it, surgery if you need it? What do we do to prepare you? And for afterwards, and how do we get you healthier before, to healthier afterwards than you have been before? So, and and we have time. We have time. I have a half an hour minimum and an hour usually with patients, especially new patients, where we can really discuss what's happening in your life. If you are so stressed and overworked and can't sleep you're going to eat unhealthy. You're not going to be exercising. So we, we focus on every single aspect of your life. That time must feel like a little bit of paradise when you, you know, we're so locked into typical medical practice with that five minutes yep. on a, on a treadmill and getting people in and out of the office. And you know, what, the, what kind of message does that really convey? Yep. But that combination of evidence base and then really walking the talk really makes such a huge difference because you know and i know that no matter how erudite we be no matter how good those lectures are most of the time we're affecting people more by our example than most of the stuff that we actually say to them they can pick up on that energy they can pick up on that you know the the enjoyment the connection to life and that's part of the healing process people don't realize how powerful that actually is you know what i'm saying so that's really beautiful that you've got that opportunity um, you know, I noticed that, of course, you deal with many things that are involved on the chronic disease spectrum, which, of course, include everything from heart disease, high blood pressure. You've talked about diabetes a little bit. But I noticed that one of the things that you tend to focus on, and I want to discuss this a little bit with you, is that you're very aware of the importance of stress and stress management. And you also work 
with food addictions. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with a lot of addiction through the years. And we know that that's such a constellation, a problem that it deals with a constellation of factors that include, you know, physical, emotional, even spiritual components. So talk to me about how you integrate that and work with people that are suffering or dealing with those kinds of issues. Let's, let's discuss that just a little bit. Sure. So, hi, I'm Kim. I'm a chocoholic. There is no question. I am, I have an addictive personality and I get um, food addiction because I am addicted to food. I used to eat everything all the time as much as I wanted. And that's why I was big and unhealthy. Now I eat what I want as much as I want, but it's healthy foods and I'm not big and I'm not unhealthy. And I, I can manage it so much differently than before. I used to think, gosh, I wish I was an alcoholic or a tobacco smoker because you can just stop drinking and you could just stop smoking, but you can't stop eating. Right. I actually came to the conclusion that that was wrong way of thinking because alcoholics need to drink. They need to drink water, but they don't need to drink alcohol. Smokers need to breathe. They need to breathe air in, but they don't need to breathe tobacco. I need to eat but I don't need to eat toxic foods that are unhealthy for me. And that change has helped me a lot, but I also have lots of techniques to work with people who have food addictions. Um, as you say, working with stress makes a huge difference. When we're not sleeping, when we're stressed, we're gonna grab whatever we have. And as Jeff AJ says, if it's in your house, it's in your mouth. Mm -hmm. And so I have to keep my house clean. I mean, when I started dating my my significant other who had the accident, Derek, he, um, the rule was my house is clean. When we go out, you can have whatever you want, but you cannot bring unhealthy things into my house because I can't, I'm, I don't have a very good uh, self-control that way. And I know that about myself. So there's tons of techniques we can use with people who have food addictions. Sometimes though, we need to deal with history. Why are you? Right eating to the point that's damaging to your health. We need, and that may mean, you know, some psychological care that may, you know, dealing with past traumas. We deal with pre-planning and having things available in, in your house that are on the counter that are easy grab and go like an apple versus Oreos. You know, we, we talk about different techniques. Uh, and one that thing that's nice about Love.Life Telehealth is I can go into their kitchen we can, they can walk me around and I can say, okay, we need to do this, 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 and this. And you're going it, to, it's helpful. It, I saw that. I saw that one of your passions is cooking for the non cooks. I saw that in something that you wrote online. So talk a little bit about that because you know, the truth of the matter is people sometimes have this feeling that doing this kind of food is so complex. Yeah, but again, it's like everything, whatever you've been doing for a long time has become ingrained. It's been woven into your behavioral tapestry. So something new can become a behavior and an easy process just as easily as something you were doing before. It's just the question of allowing that into your life and allowing some time factor for that to kind of become part of you. So talk about that way that you integrate cooking for non-cooks. Let's just touch on that briefly. So I... I am, a ter I am a terrible cook. I love doing dishes, but I'm a terrible cook. So things that are easy for me, one pot makes a difference. So I'll have an Instapot and I'll put, and I'm lazy and I um, multitask. So I'll put my oats, my, my oat groats, my um, farro and a bunch of grains in one thing. And I'll put it all in the crock pot with a bunch of lentils and cook it all at once. So I have my lentils and, and, um, or beans in, and uh, sometimes I'll put tofu, uh, not tofu, um, soybeans in, and just cook it all at once. And I'll have that cooked in a big batch and I'll put it in the refrigerator. And then I'll have things like my, so the Instapot is a great thing. And then I'll have my Vitamix and I'll have all my greens and things on that and put in lots and lots of greens and some frozen fruit because I don't, I don't like things going bad. So I have a lot of frozen fruits that I just stick in there and mix it all up with some ground flax seeds and, and cinnamon and some healthy things for me. And so I'll make a green smoothie or I'll have my, my grains in the morning with our, our greens on top and then my frozen fruit and a bunch of things and put it in the microwave and 
there I've got a complete meal. So I make things simply. I prepare. Um, soups are great in a crock pot, in, in a pot, Instapot or something similar to that, where you can just make a big batch of soup. Make enough for yourself for that day, the next day, but also enough to freeze. And I use the freezer a lot. Um, so those are kind of easy, cheap ways like rice and beans. Changing things around, like I never thought that a salad would be a, a reasonable dinner. But you, if you look at my salads, I'll, I'll show you. This is my cup of water. My salad bowl is as big as my head too. And so you can just put a whole bunch of salad things. And I even put some grains in there and some lentils. Well, one of the singularly great experiences is just cutting baked potatoes into a salad. And with the nice, simple dressings, the taste is just magnificent. You know, so those kinds of little strategies can kind of integrate all kinds of things. Do you demo this too uh, when you're on the telehealth service? Do you go into your kitchen and show people how to do some of this? I have done that if they yeah, ask. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. That's great. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's great because you get lots of good tips from your patients too. Oh, I've tried this. Or, and I've got a list of, for my patients of like Shane and Simple and easy people who um, who have recipes online or easy one or uh, Mastering Diabetes, Cyrus Kambada and Robbie Barbero have a great things in their books that are easy to put together right, right. quick. Um, and that's helpful because sometimes we have don't have time and that's not good because then you're gonna grab for what's there and you have to grab for, you only have to, you can only have in your, my fridge is so different than it used to be. It used to be empty with a couple of, you know, Milky Way bars and a bunch of other stuff. Now it's full of greens and, and veggies and, and it's, it's full. It's great. It's such a different life that I lead. And you think before, I can't do that. I can't change. Well, I lived in Sri Lanka for two years and I didn't have American food when I lived in Sri Lanka. I was, I was in the Peace Corps um, in deaf education and I had pretty much a, a a vegan lifestyle because they're Buddhist over there. Right. And so it was rice. And I thought when I decided to change, I was like, wait a minute, I've done this before. And I can just think of this as going to another country and changing my habits. And then you get your palate changes. Like I love and crave salads now. I right. love a huge salad for dinner. I love, um, rice and beans for breakfast. And you think, oh no, I'm not gonna have beans for breakfast. Well, British people have beans on toast. You know, people in South America have rice and beans for breakfast all the time. It's Absolutely. just what we're used to. And that doesn't mean it's it has to be that way. So you mean when stress hits the fan and Kim gets even overwhelmed, there's not even a little interest in chocolate, not even a oh, little absolutely. <laughs> I totally crave it, but I don't have it in my house because if it was in, you know, that would be bad. It's a so, major trigger, and I get that. Yes, I yeah. get that. I'm being playful. Um, mm -hmm. When you're dealing with your clients on telehealth, you know, many of these people also have their home care physicians that they've, of course, counseled with and are in their lives who are more of those disease managers. So are, are there any conflicts with compliance when you're dealing with people and they kind of go back to their original docs and the docs kind of saying, you know, what did that crazy doctor on telehealth tell you to do? Is any of that happen? Do you have to deal with any of that? A hundred percent all the time. And I laugh because there's often, I'll give my patients studies to say, bring this to your doc so that they can see the studies, um, especially with cancer patients or I'll use the, you know, I'll use protocols that are already in place that, and I'll tell people, say you're an ethical vegan, even if you're not, because then you can work around it. But um, I have had, more than once, more than a couple of times, patients come back to me and say, my cholesterol plummeted. And the doctor said, well, the first labs were incorrect, you know, because they don't believe that what I say works. Or I've had patients who say their doctors say, oh yeah, you know, people, but people can't do it. Yes, you should be eating healthier. You should be moving more, but people can't do it. And then I have Patients like recently, I had a patient who um, went back to her neurologist because she had some issues that were very concerning in her brain and they have reversed. And the doctor is thrilled. He's like, I couldn't, you don't need to come back because your MRI has changed. You look better. You feel better. You don't have the symptoms anymore. And 
that really is helpful. So we have the whole gambit of don't that there that's a crazy doctor, don't listen to her, in which I give them um, the studies to bring it to the doctor themselves because I want to teach the doctors. Right. I didn't know this, and I wish I had known this a lot earlier. So I'd like patients to teach their doctors so their other patients can be helped. You know, and then there's the gambit of I don't believe it. You know, I don't believe the results. It was just an erroneous. And then this is fantastic. I'm so proud of you. I wish I could do this, but they can. They just have to get learn more about it. So I'll before tell. We, before we go on, let's people uh, let people let's let, let people find and know where they can reach you. So, what's a location that they can use to find you if they want to learn more about you, book some time with you? So, give us a little bit of a, you know a, a location, an online location for you. So you can go to love life backslash backslash telehealth and look for me Kim slash uh, Kim I, Shorter, MD. You can check that out under there, or you can just go to Love Life Telehealth, and you'll be able to search for me or anybody else. For example, I've got twenty five um, licenses. In, I'm licensed in twenty five states. So if you're in a state watching this where I'm not licensed. I, we have great other doctors who are amazing. And, and even if there's two or three people in the state that I'm in, go and look at everybody's profile and feel and see who you fit with even more, you know? Kim, one of the great stress disorders that, uh, you know, some people suffer with is uh, of interest to some of our population that's watching this, and that's migraine headaches. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to just touch on that a little bit. So why don't you give us a little bit of your take on dealing with that situation? So migraines are, I've seen migraines a lot in my patients and I've seen them reversed with lifestyle medicine. In fact, my, uh, one of my coworkers who was thin, thought she was healthy, didn't thought I was crazy when I started doing this. And this is not in love, uh, like telehealth, this was in Aspen, um, made fun of me, switched to what I was doing and said, and her migraines went away. And I, and I was like, why did, well, she, she kept doing it. I couldn't understand after she'd done it for a month. And she said, it's because my daily migraines went away and I will do anything to keep them from coming back. So that was kind of interesting, but migraines are associated with inflammation of the brain. That's one of the reasons you can have it. So going on an anti-inflammatory diet makes a difference. Avoiding triggers makes a difference. Um, there's a recent study out uh, that showed that you can go to a plant-based diet that's unhealthy with a lot of um, processed foods versus a plant-based diet that's healthy. And you have met much less migraines with a healthy plant-based diet than with an unhealthy plant-based diet. But if you get rid of saturated fats, which clog up the arteries in your, in your brain and can cause things, um, it, that which means getting rid of meats and some palm oils and coconut oils, things like that, that can decrease your migraines. Um, there's been weight reduction makes a difference in migraines. Um, exercise makes a difference in migraines. Stress makes a difference in migraines. So we work very carefully with our pa patients who happen to have migraines who are on medicine, because there's, there's medicines that you can take prophylactically or abortively. So prophylactically means before you have a migraine, you can take medicines. Or if you have a migraine that's just started, you can take a medicine to abort that migraine. They all have side effects. So it's much, much better to, to work on the lifestyle changes that, that you can talk to us about, any one of the plant-based doctors about, um, or the, the love.life doctors about, to decrease your frequency, severity um, of migraines and I can't tell you how many of my patients have stopped having migraines because of that was like for me the some of the weird side effects that I didn't expect, you know, my teeth and my knee pain and all that. A lot of patients come to me not for the migraines, and but then the migraines go away and we can get them off meds or prevent them from taking meds. So well, it's, so, it's so important because as you know, when people are suffering with that situation, um they just feel it's somewhat hopeless. So this message of hope centered around very simple but strategic lifestyle choices is such a powerful message. And people know that they can fix that, they can change that, they don't have to live a life of suffering with that. So that's important. Yeah. 
uh, you know, you're a, you know, you're, you're a busy person between private practice, telehealth and all that. And of course, many of the people watching this and, you know, we always get into that mentality, as you brought up earlier, uh, about, you know, making the real time to live our own lifestyle medicine in a very effective way. And I know that you're an active person. You like biking and skiing and, and those kinds of things. So let's talk about how Kim makes time for that in her busy schedule so people can be inspired in their own lives to make those kinds of changes. So I have, I used to get up at five o'clock in the morning and go hike up a mountain. Now, since I've changed my lifestyle and I'm, I have the ability to, I schedule my patients at very different times of the day. So I'll have tonight after this, I'll have two patients tonight on a Tuesday evening because some people work and some people, you know, so I've had all day to go right. play with my dogs, be out in nature, um, I, and, uh, just do the exercise and the, the de-stressing that I, I need to. So I very rarely work a full day. I have Wednesdays are my full days. Um, I work odd hours. I work Saturdays because it, it works well for me. And then I have patients who can see me then. So first thing in the morning, it's really important to get up and get out and be with my dogs. So having pets makes a difference. I take my dogs out. So I get out and walk my dogs early in the morning. I take time between patients to go out, to exercise, to, um, to move every day, no matter what kind of movement it is. I also now live very simply. I, um, we live off grid. So in the winter time, I have to shovel my solar panels. We have a growing dome where we grow our own vegetables. So after go, trudging to, shovel the snow, the solar panels. I go and I grab some veggies that I'll have for breakfast. Um, I chop wood, which we use in our wood stove. So I incorporate it. In you, realize, you realize this is about as hippie as it gets, right? Shoveling solar panels, getting your greens and chopping wood. That's like amazing. I love it. And it's so <laughs> fantastic. Really serious. <laughs> um, let me ask you a question. So for Kim, for you on the horizon, I, I, I'm always intrigued with the kind of work you're doing and the telehealth service that you're connected to. Is part of a goal to either even gather information to expand the evidence base from the, from the patient load that you have on the telehealth service? Is any of that on your horizon or the horizon of the service itself to be able to kind of integrate more and more of the data of working with people in the ways that you do and really nicely expanding that evidence base to influence this world in a very powerful way. Yes, we are definitely, we're trying to work with, we're planning on working with some surgeons on um, pre-op information and, and take and get data from that about how different diets help you pre-operatively to heal post-operatively. We, um, a, a lot of our doctors, including myself, often go on Rochester Lifestyle Medicine Institute's um, Grand Rounds and teach other doctors and other people, and we, we share cases with them. We hopefully soon uh, in the next year, we'll be working on many more studies with our own, you know, just seeing how the better, the best ways to introduce lifestyle to people's lives and what works better whether, you know, and each person is different. Each person has their own uh, needs, but, and each person deals with things differently. Like I jumped straight in. Some people need to go in slowly. Um, we have a lot of people who come to see us with diabetes and we use, we love, love, love the Mastering Diabetes crew, um, Cyrus Kambada and Robbie Barbero. They're amazing. We love working with them and their, patient, their, their clientele become our patients, and we work together to um, get more data about improving both type 1 and type 2 and type 1.5 and, you know, all the different kinds of diabetes that are out there. Um, so, yeah, I would like to, uh, at Love.Life Telehealth, we are going to work more and more to use... Um, different techniques and different technology to improve our, our patients' health and outcomes. And we plan to study them and, and use and, and gather more information so we can spread it out to more people. Again, evidence-based. We don't want right. um, 
you know, we, we want to make sure that what we are doing is correct. And with all science, things change with time and we learn and we teach and, you know, work with doing the best we can for our patients. Well, Kim, as we wind this down, do you have any final words you'd like to really share with our audience out here? Um, you are worth it. You are absolutely worth living a healthy life. And it doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. At any age, this can be happen. I've had, I think my oldest patient was 93 who changed her lifestyle and felt so much better and was much more independent and, um, you know, got getting off of meds so that she has to spend less money every month. You know, so it doesn't matter. I've dealt with four-year-olds in my practice to 93-year-olds in my practice. And it is never too late. You are worth it to take the time to take care of yourself so that you can take care of others and make the world a better place. And my goal is to teach one person who will teach other people, who will teach other people and make it just a better place for everyone. That's fantastic. I, I can't thank my guest, uh, Dr. Kim Scheuer, enough uh, for being with us today. It was an absolute delight sharing your insight, your joy, your love of life, your expertise. And I urge uh, the people watching to uh, follow Kim if you want to really take advantage of the kinds of care that she's providing, jumpstarting your health. You can see her location in the show notes that are connected to where we are today. Uh, I also want to really thank our audience for being with us today, because without you, we can't do what we do. And I want to really thank you for being part of this really active, healthy community. And on behalf of the National Health Association, I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I look forward to being with you on the next episode of the Health Science Podcast. Thank you so much, Kim. You've been listening to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association. Thank you for joining us today and for your commitment to evidence-based health science that backs a whole food plant exclusive lifestyle and contributes to the well-being of all people, animals, and our environment. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Be sure to leave a rating and a review, and we'll see you on the next show.